Hi everyone, my name is Dennis Dyack. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at a new company called Precursor Games. We have started an exciting new Kickstarter project called Shadow of the Eternals. We are really excited of the potential of this game. For the first time, we are combining a crowdfunding effort on Kickstarter with community-driven content where gamers can actually add content to the game driven all through an episodic model. We think the potential for this is fantastic. And for the many years of which I've been saying, I want to create games that I want to play, for the first time we can say gamers can participate in creating the type of games that they want to play. Despite our excitement and us wanting to move forward and me focusing on the creative, something keeps rearing its ugly head that Paul Caparici, our CEO, has asked me to come here to address. And that is the Kotaku article that was released uh, last year. So that's what I'm here to do today. So to put this in context, so people understand what we're talking about, um, we have been trying to raise money through crowdfunding on Kickstarter, which is a, a way in which people look at your project, assess the potential, and see if they want to donate money to your cause. And out of the gate, we were doing quite well, but then we started getting consistent feedback towards the following, and let me read this. This is from Reaper, who's on our forums. I've been getting a lot of negative feedback in the forums lately, how Dennis Dyack has lied and so on, and maybe Precursor Games can clarify things up. And he goes on a bit, and then he goes on to say, it's getting harder and harder to find people who are willing to pledge ever since that Kotaku article. It is discouraging at best. So the problem that we're facing is not only that some of the allegations made against me are affecting me, but they're affecting everyone here at Precursor Games and others who want to get this project funded. So we thought the best way to address this issue was to ask people to post questions on our forums that I would come here, come here to you in this forum and answer those questions. So that's what I'm here to do today. So one of the first questions, one of the first general questions that I'd like to address, and it was asked in many different ways on the forum, but here's one from Dale uh, Furtwaltz, uh, or Furwaltz. I'm sorry, if, Dale, if I pronounced your name wrong. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing names. If the, claims, if the claims made in Kotaku were so erroneous and uncalled for, why have, why have you had to wait so long to hear Dennis tell us the accusations are false? and other questions of why are you waiting so long and of before coming out and saying. And from my perspective, let me be clear on the position. When I first saw this article, I believed because there was not a single credible source where nothing could be verified that anyone would actually believe this. I knew what they were saying and the accusations about me embezzling money from Activision and, uh, being terrible to people were not true, but I never really thought that people would believe it. But from my perspective, now that I look at it, I probably should have come out sooner because I underestimated, uh, I guess, the advance of technology on the internet and how were before, I would say, old newspapers, before they would quote another article, would actually do some further research to make sure that the research behind that one article was credited. But today on the internet, people just link and relink and link and relink. And whether that article was linked 100 times or 100,000 times, every time that it was linked, it got this incremental shred of credibility to the point where now it's very clear to me that everyone or a lot of people feel that this is true. And this is why now I'm coming out to say, I've got to do something about this because it's affecting me, it's affecting my colleagues at Precursor Games, and it's also affecting the community who want to see this game get made. So that's one of the reasons why I haven't come forward. Another reason why I'm coming forward today to talk about it is that I was always aware that the allegations were not true, but the severity of which and the level of which people thought it was real was not made apparent until we started trying to do fundraising when it became, became overwhelmingly obvious from everyone here at Precursor, all of uh, 
our fans trying to get this game promoted that they continued to run into this wall. And what really is disappointing for me is that such serious allegations are being made credible that it's gotten a life on its own and there isn't any hard evidence whatsoever besides non-credible anonymous sources that this ever occurred. But you don't have to believe me on that. You can believe Andrew himself, who wrote the article. During the course of this whole investigation, Andrew contacted us several times saying that he had anonymous sources, that he wanted to talk to us about this. And we asked him at one point, can you give us the questions ahead of time? He refused to. And I think it was chatting with our PR representative and said he wanted to get the tone of my voice and that he's been researching this for a long time. And we realized that if I actually came on the record and said something, he would actually have his first credible source, making his article more credible. So we decided not to comment because we felt the allegations were all untrue. But you don't have to just believe me. Let's see what Andrew wrote. During the course of investigation that Andrew had, we happened to intercept some emails from one of his sources who appeared to be concerned about what was actually happening and forwarded us some of that information. So this is an, an, an email from Andrew McMillan. It stated the 1st of January 20th, 2012. I'm not going to say who the source is to protect his anonymity. I don't want anyone to get in trouble over this. But I, I will read the subject. Media request, wired, re-Silicon Knights, comma, X-Men Destiny. Hi, blank. I hope you are well and that 2012 is making you happy so far. This is a reasonably long an important email. I appreciate your time and attention. Please keep this correspondence confidential. I'm writing to give you an update of my planned feature story about Silicon Knights entitled Why did X-Men Destiny Why did X-Men Destiny suck so bad? I think the title changed since the print in Kotaku. I have been working on this story since July 2011. And when I was first contacted by someone called SK Whistleblower, who tipped me off about SK's plans not to include former employees in the XMD credits, this is how I came to contact you. Last week, I filed a 5,700 word draft to the gaming editor at Wired. The story based on interviews conducted with eight former employees of Silicon Knights. It touches upon the game's history development, the way SK managed SK management have long attempted to distance themselves from publishers as much as possible and secure a contract. How around 40% of the studio were diverted to work on Eternal Darkness 2 demo, on Eternal Darkness 2 demo while seeking a time and budget extension from Activision and how Activision were the first studio to demand that SK release XMD, XMD despite its poor quality. SK has refused to provide comment Activision have ignored my request. The gaming editor at Wired, Chris Kohler, expressed significant interest in my draft. However, after discussing the manager after, after discussing the matter with his managing editor, they decided not to go ahead with the story in its current state. This is what we, he told me. This is a quote. There are a lot of serious allegations in the story, not least the idea that Silicon Knights is trying to scam publishers out of money and not deliver games. But there are no real facts, documentation, etc., to back any of this up besides the word of anonymous ex-employees. And then Andrew goes on to say, which is fair enough. When I saw that, I read this and went, he knows he doesn't have any hard facts here. And in the article, it implied that people were staying anonymous to either protect themselves 
are to protect the current employees at Silicon Knights, which I think in, in one example, if you look at that and say that's possible. However, with anonymous sources, it's also possible that they're not coming forward because they can be immediately discredited, discredited from what knowledge and role they had at the company and if they possibly could have known these things that they claim are true. So I want and hope people can see that for what it is. He goes on to say, as it stands, the most controversial potential da damaging claim within my stories that Silicon Knights have had a long history of deceiving publishers by intentionally pushing out their deadlines and budgets while using the publisher's supplied cash to fund development of their own IP. I believe this is a claim that could potentially ruin SK if it is published. I should point out that it's not my intention to ruin SK. I am simply reported what's being told to me by yourself and several other former colleagues. If you read the Kotaku article, it's also said in there that Silicon Knights is Dennis and Dennis is Silicon Knights. So I can only draw from the conclusion that Knowing that he knew it would ruin Silicon Knights, he also had a firm understanding or at least an idea that would also ruin my reputation. And to a certain extent, I think he was absolutely correct in that regard. When we talked about us even coming out with this, there are several quotes out there that I think really exemplify this. And this was made by Mick. Kiever Fever 1988 on YouTube yesterday. Dennis Dyack does not deserve a second chance after all allegations of how he treated his former employees. Even people that found and love Ed will still not fund this project, including myself. DD is toxic in the industry, DD being Dennis Dyack, I assume. And he has had his chance and he blew it. He fucked people over and ran his company into the ground. Now, not only are these allegations not true, there are many, many reasons why I could easily state why, they're, why they aren't true. The first is, not only did Silicon Knights not divert funds from X-Men Destiny to our other projects, which I can't talk about, we actually put more money into X-Men Destiny, Destiny than what we were paid. Halfway through the project, I sat down with the executives from Activision trying to make the project the best it could be. And we talked about how Silicon Knights had spent $2 million more than what we had been paid. Because we realized that after Two Human, which one of, was one of our worst Metacritic scoring games since our previous games, that we wanted our next game to be as good as possible. So Silicon Knights put its own money in. The people at Activision were stunned by this. We went over the figures and numbers and now the allocations. And then when they realized that it was true, what they said to me was, they re we really appreciate this, Dennis, but we don't know if that's a good business move. And they, we then got together to try to work out all the issues on the project, both Marvel and Activision and Silicon Knights, and we did the best that we could. I will say this, we are really sorry how that game turned out. I would think that there were some mistakes made, but all I can tell you is that we did nothing but put our best efforts into this project. Both Activision, Silicon Knights, and Marvel, we all tried to make it work out, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. And I can only apologize. I have said some things out there that I shouldn't have said in the press about this project and other projects, and I apologize for that. I'm sorry. I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson so much that a precursor, I am not making business decisions like that, like putting more money into a project than what we're getting paid. Sean and Paul are running precursor. Those mistakes will not happen again. I am focusing on the creative. Furthermore, and my last point to this particular accusation, if you look at the article, it says that eight former employees totaling uh, 
45 years of experience at Silicon Knights uh, were interviewed for this. So if you do the quick math, the average is about five years. There's no way anyone at Silicon Knights between five to seven or even eight years would possibly know the budget allocations for this. Very few people know that. And for the people who do know that, um, through a simple process of elimination, I can assure you that these are not the people who are quoted in these anonymous sources. It did not happen. It was not, it would never happen. And if anything, Silicon Knights spent more money on X-Men Destiny than we were actually paid for. But there's yet one further thing, if you still don't believe that. Silicon Knights had a very open policy when working with its partners. There are these two programs that you use for project management. One is called Perforce and another is called Handsoft. Perforce is a database management system where you store all of your files for your game. Activision had complete open visibility to this. So what that meant was if they ever wanted to see where the project was on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, they could pull down the build and look at it themselves. Handsoft was a complementary program that worked with Perforce. And what that does is it tracks every single man hour of every employee working on the project so you could see what they were working on, what they were checking in. So at all times, Activision had the ability to look at what person was working on what project and when they could look at it. These were some of the things that we used to verify how much money we had spent on the project with Activision when discussing it with them, and how we were trying to make this project the best it can be. The last thing that I'll talk about are audits. Silicon Knights was audited by many entities, some friendly, some not friendly, some neutral. I can assure everyone here that in order to get these audits accomplished, you have to diligently go over the man hours and who was working on what project. At no time ever, did Silicon Knights divert anyone from uh, X-Men Destiny or budget allocated uh, to another project. In fact, if anything, we had more people working on the Activision project than what we were getting paid for. I am not the only one who feels strongly that these allegations are not true. Sean Thompson, who is here as our tech director and was also uh, high up at Silicon Knights, um, had this to say, when a lot of people on our forums were asking questions about the Kotaku article and the allegations made within. And this is what Sean writes. From what I can tell, the concerns are focused around the Kotaku article that was published that clearly targeted Dennis as opposed to SK. When I read the article, I was embarrassed for those anonymous sources, and I dismissed it as journalistic sensationalism used to excite controversy at Dennis's expense. So not exactly along the lines of what I said earlier, but clearly Sean was surprised at the level in which people took this article seriously as well. Sean goes on, any allegations that paint Dennis as a malicious or underhanded are completely untrue. For example, the allocations of funneling funds from one project to another are false, which I can say with confidence because I was directly involved with those manpower allocations. The, if the article was accurate, I would not have spent six years at Silicon Knights, he calls it SK here, and I definitely wouldn't be sacrificing as much as I am to make Shadow of the Eternals a reality. Just to make it clear, Sean is at Precursor right now, and I also work together with him at Silicon Knights. It's a very different capacity. Um, Sean directly answers to Paul now, not me. I'm purely creative, but Sean has come out and said these things. What I found particularly interesting about Sean's post was that the first person to pick this up in the press and tweet about it, at least that we've seen, was Chris Kohler. If you remember, he was the one mentioned in Andrew's email that was, was at Wired who did not pick this article up. Thank you very much, Chris, for doing the right thing here. And I also want to thank all the other press who alerted us that they are continually turning down this article because they didn't think it was credible. You know who you are. We appreciate it. For those who want a little bit of background on this, several times Andrew emailed us and said that this article was coming out. And several times it never came out. Finally, for some reason, and we can't explain, Kotaku decided that they would publish this. Some allegations in the Kotaku article 
alluded to why Silicon Knights left Nintendo or how we felt about Nintendo. I can say this, that the relationship with Nintendo and me personally is still very, very good. Mr. Iwata was the person who recommended Silicon Knights become a second party with Nintendo. He is a great person and I, I am privileged to be able to say that I worked with him and he is fantastic. The same with Mr. Miyamoto. Our relationship at Precursor remains good and strong. And what's said in the article here, I will now address and in this question. The quotes, and this is from Mapster on our website. The quotes in the article say, Silicon Knights split from Nintendo due to the name of the console and Wii's limited graphics. Um, none of that is true whatsoever. We didn't even know the name of the console uh, at that point. And we had no idea of what the limitations were or anything like that. Can you elaborate on what went into this colossal decision and how you look on this in retrospect? And then they quote the Kotaku article. Once Nintendo were out of the picture, SK could do whatever it wanted, sources say. Dennis believed that SK was finally out from the oppressive nature of Nintendo as a publisher. And once Dennis was given more freedom, things started to fall apart. This is one of the most ridiculous accusations in this article. It is not founded on any level of accuracy, nor in any way is true to how I felt about Nintendo. Silicon Knights and Nintendo went different ways because of the type of games that we wanted to make. We talked about that in the press a long time ago and nothing has changed. We have great respect for each other and we were both disappointed that um, we couldn't go further. But it was, we both agreed that if we wanted to make the type of games that we wanted to make, it didn't fit within Nintendo's portfolio. And as much as we tried, it didn't work out. There's nothing more to it than that. But say that SK or Dennis was finally uh, to set free of Nintendo's oppressive nature. Nintendo was not oppressive in any way. They are some of the best people we have ever worked with in the history of the industry. I value the experience with them greatly, and I always will cherish memories of working with Miyamoto-san and Awada-san and other people from Nintendo. They were not oppressive, they were constructive. They were brave, and they allowed us to create a game, games like Eternal Darkness and Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes that rarely are seen today. And that allegation could not be further from the truth. Another question comes from Blackgate. And in it, he writes, Dennis Dyack, as a man who has repeatedly stated to the company that his artists are a dime a dozen and can be replaced. And the questions surrounding that related questions that I treated people terribly, that I didn't respect anyone at Silicon Knights. Well, I can only say that nothing could be further from the truth and that if you look at my quotes in the industry, they're very consistent. And in those, I would say things like, I believe computers are like $10,000 pencils where they are absolutely nothing. They have no value compared to the force and the creative force behind people making our games. That is, that is consistent. I've always felt that way. And furthermore, if you were to look at the average salary at Silicon Knights, you would see that we paid people approximately between twenty-five to 30000 more than the average salary in St. Catharines alone. We also paid people salaries that were comparable with places all over the world, uh, including very large publishers and very large cities. If I really felt artists were a dime a dozen, I certainly would not have paid them in that way. And finally, if, you, if I really did feel that way about artists, I don't think people like Kevin Gordon, who is now at Precursor and, and decided to join Precursor along with me, would want to be here or that he would have been at Silicon Knights for over 20 years, like many other artists that enjoyed tenure between 15 and 20 years. 
If that was truly the case, and I really had no respect for these people, I do not understand, with all the altern alternatives out there in the video game industry, why they would have stayed at Silicon Knights for so long. One of the questions is posed that was posed in our forums was from What's Up 2022. Why did such crucial veteran staff leave, and where are they now? <laughs> well, that's very general, um, but it does go on to point out some of the allegations made in the Kotaku article that says that alludes to Activision being upset, not being informed of people leaving, and then demanding that we inform them. I can just tell you that none of that is true, um, and that it's a common courtesy for partners to tell people when people leave and move on. And we did that, but there was never a demand or that they felt out of the loop uh, for people who were leaving on the project. Silicon Knights was going through some very difficult times and there were layoffs, people tend to leave. But there was never this exodus that this Kotaku article alluded to. I can see people feeling that way that there was an exodus because they look at themselves as some of those people that have left and they see their own world as moving on. But Silicon Knights continued to work on the project and had people with a lot of experience working on it and uh, Activision was informed the whole time. So um, I really don't know how to address that any other way except uh, people leave companies, it's very common, and that if anything, the turnaround or the turnover while I was at Silicon Knights was very low compared to most companies. And I think that's because of the way that people were treated in a positive way. And I'm happy to say that since I've started at Precursor, many old friends that worked at Silicon Knights have contacted us up, you know, me personally, others, and said congratulations and have sponsored this project. I don't believe if things were really that bad at Silicon Knights that these people would have done that. The other allegation made in the Kotaku article is that somehow Activision stepped in to change our credits at Silicon Knights. For anyone who is in game development at, at a production level or higher, or especially at an executive level, knows that generally no one wants to get involved with anyone's credits from another company because it is so difficult because of the problems I described earlier. But I can tell you for a fact that the person who made the final call on the credits was myself. And that the only comment that we got from Activision about the credits was, please don't do that again, it may introduce further bugs. And I understand that. Because that is true, that is a reality of our business and changing anything in the code may result in a bug. It's not that Activision didn't care, Activision does care, but they rely on us to get our, our part of the project in line and they get their part of the project in line. So I can, I can assure you that there was nothing even close to that or it never happened on the project and that allegation is completely untrue. I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that I've come here today to say that I haven't made any mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes. I have said a lot of things that I shouldn't have said. I have done some things that I regret. And all I can say is that I have learned from them, that I have changed the way that I think about things and that I really wanna move forward in a positive way and focus on what I do best which I think is focusing on creative. I've been lucky enough to have people here at Precursor willing to let me do that while they run the company. I also want to add that I am focusing on the future and what great things we're doing at Precursor. We have what I think is really, really special. We're doing crowdfunding that allows us to create a game that normally would never get funded in the industry. We're working with the community to actually create content through the order of the unseen. And we're delivering it in a way through episodic content that allows a continual loop of feedback and interaction with the order. These three things together, I really do think is something different. And there's an opportunity that is worth pursuing. The only way that I can look at this and move forward in a in a positive way is to learn from all those mistakes that I made from the past and for people like you to understand that yes, Dennis may have made some mistakes in the past, but he really is focused on making this game the best it can be. Hi, I'm Paul Capricci, Chief Executive Officer at Precursor Games. And I'm Sean Jackson, Chief Operating Officer at Precursor Games. 
You've just heard Dennis address many of the allegations from the Kotaku article, but there was one more question that I wanted to answer. It comes from Purple Griffin. He asks, more specifically to Paul, what is your relationship with Dennis and why would you pick him knowing all the controversy that would follow him? My relationship with Dennis is I think he's one of the most creative pe persons that I've ever met in this industry and I think he's an invaluable member of our team. Uh, when the Kotaku article came out, I immediately dismissed it because I knew reality and none of those allegations were true. Unfortunately, many of the other people believe it's true and I was shocked of the controversy that uh, surrounded it. He also goes on to ask, I know Dennis is not the head of Precursor, but he's the chief creative officer and has a lot of influence on the project they work on. That's true. Everyone at Precursor has a lot of influence on the, uh, on the projects they work on because that's my management style to take advice and input from everyone. But at the end of the day, it's my decision. And Dennis had reservations about doing uh, this, this video interview, but I felt like it was essential that we uh, hit these issues head on and uh, discuss them. Yeah, one of the, the memories that I wanted to share with uh, about Dennis is that um, back at the, in, in the studio environment, there were a select few people that uh, made it their mission to, to paint him in, in a certain kind of light. And it concerned me a lot. And so I'm, I made it my mission to uh, address those concerns and actually bring them to Dennis. And at the time, I, I was nervous going into it. And when I set up that meeting um, and, and, and went, to, went to Dennis himself, I was immediately disarmed because he, he um, welcomed me with, uh, with open arms and, and open door policy. And, and right away, I got the sense that he was very generous and caring about what I had to say. And from after going over the issues, um, he, he was very sincere and cared about uh, what was going on in the studio environment. So we crafted up some action plans on how we would actually handle that and those concerns. So for me, that actually um, just grounded him so much and, and, and made him seem uh, um, like a, a genuine person. And he was very generous and, and caring about the matter. So that generated a lot of respect in, 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 um, in, in my books. So, so now we are at a new company called Precursor Games, and we felt that Dennis was an essential part of taking over the creative uh, environment for the game. Uh, he is no longer associated with the business uh, end of things. That's a job for Paul and I. And with Dennis in that role, it allows him to do something that he truly loves. And that's creating the content and storylines and game structure for Shadow of the Eternals. I hope you can see we are trying our best to address issues raised by the community. And what we'd like to do now is uh, put this Kotaku issue to rest and focus on making great games. So we would really appreciate it if you visit our Kickstarter page and for Shadow of the Eternals and pledge your support today. And we really thank everyone out there for taking the time to, to listen to us and uh, express these concerns. And uh, we really look forward to conversing with you in the future. Thank you. Thanks for your support.